our prayer is that you will be filled with the knowledge of his will, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power. Welcome to Strength to Strength Sisters. My name is Jamila Kurtz, and I'm so happy to welcome you all to this call in Jesus' name today. The vision of Strength to Strength Sisters is to encourage women to be catalysts in advancing the kingdom through biblical teaching, testimonies of faithful women, and thought-provoking discussions. I just have a few notes before we begin our call today. This call today, we're excited that we have a bit of a different format. Um, we have three sisters who are prepared to share. The call will be recorded as always and share it later on our YouTube and podcast platforms. Don't worry about your face showing on the recording. Your face shows if you are speaking. Joining us today are Charlene Stolzfus, Susan Slabach, and Crystal Miller for a discussion on ways sisters can be on the home front serving their local body of believers by reaching out to those who are single, in leadership positions and members abroad on the foreign fields. It's very interesting. I first met Susan and Charlene here in Kenya. Charlene thought her life work was going to be serving alongside her husband in some foreign African country, but she has found God's goodness as he's opened up a myriad of opportunities and adventures in her single life. She lives in Lancaster, Pennsylvania as in the, and is in the 12th year of a job that she loves teaching school. Susan has been married to Delbert for 34 years and is the mother of six children. She says she grew up believing that she would never be old enough, but now just like God, he places me as the oldest lady in her congregation. She's been a pastor's wife for 21 years and is so grateful to be plugged into the God who redeems and empowers. Crystal lives in Kansas with her husband, John and daughter, Jenna. She loves nurturing plants and children. She's passionate about growing God's kingdom by supporting those who live overseas. And she's excited about all the while investing in his work on the home front. I believe we have a great blessing just ahead for us today. I've seen the beauty of God's heart reflected in each of these sisters and I'm excited for what they're going to share. After they are done speaking, we're looking forward to hearing from you all. You can submit your questions through our chat box, or you can feel free to ask them yourself. If you do ask a question, we love if you would turn your camera on. Before I turn the time over to them, let's pray. God, we just look to you today in this moment of time. And God, I'm so thankful for this opportunity that we have, Lord, that we're in the United States and Lord, um, Australia and Kenya and all the other countries that are represented. And Lord, we're your daughters and we're just seeking you. And so Lord, I pray, especially now for those who are going to share for Crystal and Susan, Lord and Charlene. I pray Lord that you just touch them, Lord, that you would be flowing through them. I pray also for us who are hearing, Lord, that our hearts would be open. And Lord, that we can just be um, hearing from you. Lord, as you show us and you touch us. And Lord, that we could go forth, Lord, empowered and excited to share you and to care for those around us. Thank you, Lord, so much for your presence. And so we just ask, Lord, that your presence would be here with each of us now as we begin. Just ask all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Go with God, sisters. You can proceed in the order that I introduced you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Jamila, for your introduction. Um, I don't know you well, but because of Kenya, we have this connection because we both have lived there and love, mm -hmm. love Kenya. And I'm grateful for that. Um, this month, it's 14 years since my family returned to the States. And although it's been a long time, I will always carry parts of Kenya with me because it helped to shape me into who I am now. I always hoped to someday return, maybe with a husband and family, if not Kenya, then possibly Sudan or Uganda. I wanted to gift my children with the incredible experience of growing up in another culture. 
But God has obviously led me down a different path. And that dream has gone the way of other dreams I once had, but it's okay. And even good. Um, Singleness has opened other doors to so many opportunities and adventures. When I focus on the good and allow God to lead, and I'm open to risk, vulnerability, and possibly even failure, I find my life full of purpose and fulfillment and joy, even if it looks different than my earlier dreams. Here at the beginning of my talk, I want to extend a big thank you to the many single friends who gave input and helped to shape this talk. I've lived in five different communities and worked closely with many single women, whether as co-deans, co-teachers, um, mission single staff, housemates, so many lovely ladies who taught me much about relationships. Not all were those automatic kindred spirits, um, but all became good friends whom I loved doing life with. Many of these friends are still single and were happy um, to give lots of practical input for this talk. And so I want to thank you. Um, I also want to make it clear that I'm never, in the suggestions I give, pointing fingers at the women in these communities that I've been a part of. In particular, the sisters in my home church here at some of you have never made me feel as if my singleness makes me somehow less, but rather have encouraged and supported me in whatever my current mission is. It may feel as if I'm talking mostly to the married women today, but this subject is a two-way street. A lack of relationship cannot be blamed only on the married women of the church. We as singles are sometimes prickly, easily offended, and too quick in assuming things. Sometimes we also believe, maybe subconsciously, that we're of less worth because we're not married. And then we interpret your actions and word, words through, these, uh, through that lens, which is not fair to you. Healthy relationships take vulnerability and effort on both sides. Nevertheless, I was asked to speak on the question of, how can married women in the church serve singles? And so I will primarily be speaking to you all married women this afternoon. We'll be looking at two questions. Number one, how can married sisters affirm the personhood of the single women in their communities? And number two, how can married women welcome singles into their daily lives? And then last of all, I want to touch just a bit on the subject of loneliness. So our first question, how can you affirm their personhood? I'm sure we've all, all experienced times um, where we felt misunderstood or put into a box. We resent people assuming things about us and attributing unflattering motives to what we do. And whether married or single, we want to be known and understood for who we individually are. Something that quickly stood out to me while sorting through the responses my friends sent to my questions um, was that we're all so different. What causes one single friend to feel loved and valued can make the next feel imposed upon. For example, babysitting. Um, some of my single friends are honored when a mom asks them to babysit their children on Saturday. And for me as a school teacher, I'm not really. <laughs> um, I'm with children five days a week and I don't really feel like spending my Saturday babysitting. Of course, there are exceptions. And sometimes, depending on how well I know the children, I'm, I'm happy to do it. Um, but we're different. We are people and we defy, for, defy formulas. And so today, um, as I give the married some practical ways to reach out, remember that we are all different. And just as you reach out to your individual married friends in different ways, um, because they're different, so you'll need to do for your single friends as well. It boils down to relationship, and it is much easier to effectively serve and bless those we know well, um, although I'm not discounting the insightful working of the Holy Spirit. So here are some practical ways in which you can affirm the personhood of your single sister. Quoting from a friend, don't assume things about singles or put them all in a box. Don't assume I'm single because I'm too picky or too selfish, or I just decided that this is how I want my life to go. Don't assume that my life is a sad, lonely existence. Don't assume that it's always glamorous because of the freedom I do have. My story is unique, end of quote. We may have been asked out and we may have dated several times. We may have never been asked out, not even once. 
Um, we may have said no to relationships for reasons you know nothing about and we'd rather not talk about unless you're a close friend. Our stories are unique. And don't just put us into that singleness box. Also, there's often a stigma that singleness carries. Um, the married woman might say, we don't have much in common. My problems involve my husband and children and church issues and are as different from her problems as day from night. How could she possibly understand? Um, or maybe from the singles perspective, how can she understand how hard it is to always make all of my life decisions on my own? To juggle a full-time job, meals, laundry, paying the rent, grocery shopping, car issues, um, never quite knowing just where I fit into church life. But must our lives be the same in order to have relationship? While living in Kenya, my best native friend was a girl two or three years older than myself. Um, I knew little Swahili at the, at the beginning and she knew little English, but I would go to her house and she would teach me how to make ugali and sukumu and chapatis. She spoke the English I knew and I spoke the little Swahili I knew and we became friends. Um, and yet how different our lives were. She had been married at the age of 14. Um, and by the time we became friends a few years later, I think she had lost two, maybe three babies to miscarriage. Our lives were so different, um, but relationships with those different than myself helped to mold me into a better and more compassionate person. I am the oldest of seven children and the sister after me in age, Jolene, is less than two years younger, um, but then it was five years before any more siblings were born. Jolene and I were inseparable. We were 15 and 13 when our family moved to Kenya and for the next five years, there was very little that we didn't do together. We knew all the same people, had all the same friends, and shared mostly the same experiences. But then we moved back to the States at ages 20 and 18, and a little over three years later, Joan got married. She now has four children, of which the oldest is eight, and our lives are so different. Um, but we're still close friends, and she has been one of the people in my life who has helped me to see the lovely, the good, and the adventure in singleness. We help to balance each other out during those times when I get a little wistful of her husband and babies and she gets a little wistful of my freedom. Don't believe the myth that we cannot understand and enter into each other's lives simply because our life paths look so different. Just maybe I'm your chance to talk about something other than babies and housework. We're surrounded by married people and are constantly trying to understand your world and it means so much when you attempt to understand ours too. Um, another area of struggle for single women can be the area of finding a place in church life. Our family-oriented church culture is one of the strengths of our conservative churches, but there is a downside in that it does not create well, often doesn't create well, a space for the single, particularly the single without family. And so here are a few tips in the area of church life. Affirm their gifts. Do they welcome the visitor and stranger? There's a single girl in my church who does an incredible job of welcoming visitors, even though she's not super outgoing, and it really puts her out of her comfort zone. Do they do an excellent job teaching your child in Sunday school? Do they reach out to the youth girls younger than themselves? Do they invest heavily into your children by teaching in your church school? Are they willing to speak up in Sunday school? Do they graciously help clean up after the fellowship meal at church? Are they quick to help out if there's a need? Do you recognize that I, as a single, have something important to give to the church? Um, if you see a single woman reaching out to others and fulfilling God's call on her life, affirm her in it. On Mondays, my students write a short paragraph in their composition journals um, at school about church. They are supposed to mention who preached, what the message was about, something they learned in Sunday school, maybe their Sunday school memory verse, etc. And I was so blessed when a mom noticed and shared with me that she appreciates the way that it encourages her child to pay attention and jot down a few notes from the sermon. It, it means so much to us as singles when we, uh, when our service is, is affirmed and when we know that people appreciate um, how we are trying to invest in church, um, maybe even despite the fact that we're not always sure where our place is. Um, another aspect of church life, um, and this would especially be to the single 
or in regards to the single without family, adopt them. Um, this is huge when living in a community without family or when you have family, but it's very dysfunctional. I experienced this when living in state college and attending a church very different from the one I grew up in. Uh, one family would check in with me regularly to make sure that my, all my church questions were being answered. Um, and just to keep me in the loop with church things, I was not a member. And so I didn't attend all of the, the members meetings, but they wanted me to, to know what was going on. There were regular invitations from many families to meals, hikes in the woods, kayaking down Spring Creek, walks in the park, campfires. And I, I appreciated it so much. Your house and life do not need to be perfect. Um, are you okay with a single just dropping by whenever, even when it takes time and, and it might mean sacrifice for you? Um, this can also provide a safe place to get a man's input when needed. Um, even including them in activities such as family worship are very, is very special. As a single, it is, it's just difficult to find a place in the church when we don't have place in a family. Um, another aspect, does the single woman without a dad or brother in the church have any way of knowing what is discussed at the brothers' meetings or have any voice or representation in decisions made? We very much appreciate when you keep us in the loop with what's happening at church. Being asked an opinion on church issues shows that my input is valued. Another way that you can affirm the personhood of a single is to visit them at their workplace. Have you ever visited your single friend? at her job. There is a side to me that you will never see unless you come and see me interacting with my students. Did you know that I'm a great history teacher or that I'm fairly skilled at getting my students excited about things that I'm excited in? Um, the classroom is my happy place. And it's the place above all others where I have invested hours and years of my life into. Um, but few of my friends see me there. They might be working too. Uh, most single women work full-time jobs in order to support themselves. And our work is important to us. And often something that we're not only doing for the money, although that is a very real factor. Do you know what your single friend does? Um, another way that you can affirm our personhood is by inviting us to events that involve other ladies of our age group. Differing schedules can make this difficult since most of us work full time and we understand why there are often young married ladies events. But we do appreciate being invited to the baby showers, ladies teas and book studies, even if we can't always attend. Um, just the other week, my friend Lois, one of the young married ladies at church, invited me to a lemongrass party she was hosting. And it meant so much to me that she thought of including me. Um, it didn't work for me to attend, but it warmed my heart that I was invited. And we, we love to interact with other ladies our age. These are the, often the ladies that we were in the youth group with, our friends, um, and we just don't see as much of them once our lives take such different paths. And so we appreciate those invitations and being remembered. And maybe you just need to ask us. Ask us how we experience singleness in a married world and how we'd like to be related to since it's probably different for everyone. Well, I knew this time was going to be flying by way too fast. So let's quickly move on to our second question. How can married women include or welcome the single woman into their daily lives? This question does overlap um, somewhat with the other one. We Appreciate a willingness to sit down and talk anytime. We need someone to talk to sometimes, not necessarily for answers, but just to be heard. Um, some of us process by verbalizing, but what if we go home to an empty house every evening? Um, can you be that sounding board for us? Dare to confide in us as well. We know that marriage is not perfect. Your confessions won't shock us. Um, although this again depends on the single because not all singles want to hear the details. But a healthy relationship must go both ways and must involve a willingness to enter into each other's struggle. Share your children with us. Most singles do crave interaction with children. Um, like I said, teachers are sometimes an exception, but I have found it very fun to interact with children outside of school when I don't need to be their authority and when I can just have a good time with them. Um, although half the time I just end up being their authority anyway because I'm so used to it but it's fun that you know it's not my responsibility to make sure they're behaving and I can just have a good time 
Some moms are sensitive, bless their hearts, to not wanting us to feel used or like a convenient babysitter. But we do understand that our stopping by unannounced probably means that children will be around and that we will not be getting your undivided attention. Don't apologize for it. It's your life and we enjoy your children. Um, include us in parties and meals with a mixture of singles and married. Some of us enjoy participating in or at least listening in on intellectual conversations that involve men. And it means a lot um, to be invited to join that Bible study and not just to be asked to babysit the children. Um, not all singles enjoy a singles group and would much prefer to simply be invited to your house along with several married couples. Um, my sister, Jolene, no longer, she and her family no longer live here in my home community. But when they were first married, they did. And I really appreciated how she would randomly invite me over Sunday evenings um, when they had invited some other young married families or other friends over. Um, and she knew that they're my friends too. And she was quick to extend an invitation. And I really appreciated that. Um, Sunday evenings can sort of be a time when I don't quite know what to do with myself. Um, so I have this apartment above my parents garage so it's attached to their house but Sunday evenings my parents often go visiting and my younger sisters all go to youth and what do I do with myself um and so having I mean there's always people you can do things with and invite over but hosting takes a lot of energy and it just means a lot when you're invited away um during times like that Another very practical way to bless your single friend is through food. And I can hardly stress this one too much, especially in reference to a single who lives alone. Um, the way to our, uh, a woman's heart sometimes is through food as well. For sure, a single woman's heart. We don't all love to cook and it takes brain work to cook nutritious food for one person since we often don't have as many ingredients on hand. When I lived on my own in state college, my eyes were open to how long it can take to use up food when living alone. And... I soon learned to buy small amounts unless I wanted to be eating the same thing for the next week. I rarely kept both cabbage and lettuce on hand and it was usually either milk or yogurt for my morning granola that week. And one week I'd buy apples and the next grapes. I rarely cooked full course meals, um, but rather prepared only one or two items. It just didn't feel worth it to go to all that work for just one person. And so it was lovely to be invited away for a meal and to be served more than just one dish. Um, but in the, in the food, don't feel like you need to prepare an entire meal whenever you want to bless us with food. Um, we often don't bake and it means so much to get two cookies or a small loaf of pumpkin bread or just a couple of rolls when you're baking. And when I lived alone, I loved the offer of leftovers to take home for tomorrow's lunch at school. Um, another way that you can bless the single without family is to extend a standing invitation to just show up on Tuesday or Saturday or Monday evening. This provides family interaction with a variety of ages. Um, it provides interaction with men without it being weird, opportunity to get a man's perspective. It doesn't need to be fancy. You don't need to entertain us. Um, we just want to sit there beside your fire with a book and crocheting or schoolwork and not be alone. Um, as a single, hosting can look really big, especially when you're working full time. And once when I was feeling a little guilty about showing up at a friend's house again for a meal, she kindly assured me that just adding one more plate to the table takes little effort for her compared to the work that it would have taken for me to host her and her family. And I really appreciated that. Um, another way you can involve them in your life, I'm thinking especially of single women who work with your husband. If there are, if your husband is in a situation like that, make a special effort to get to know them. Um, to me, it doesn't feel healthy when I know a married man much better than I do his wife. And I really appreciate when she initiates reaching out to me and getting to know me. Sickness. Do you know how awful it is to be sick when you live alone? No, you know, probably it's awful too if you're young, married, and have lots of children that are depending on you, but it's awful to be sick alone. Um, if you know that your single friend is sick, it will mean the world to have you stop in to check up on her and make her a cup of tea or a piece of toast. And now for a common myth, <laughs> please do not assume that we have a ton of time simply because we don't have children. 
singles have limits and can't always be the person to run to the rescue ASAP. Um, we often work full-time jobs and our day off can be very full with cleaning and studying to teach Sunday school and grocery shopping and making food and finishing up lesson plans for school and finally getting that dress sewed for a wedding. Um, we want to help out, but we do feel used when treated like the on-call nanny of the community. So there are a bunch of practical ways that you can reach out to your single friends. And I don't want you to feel at all like you're not doing a good job already because I have so many wonderful married friends who have showed me clearly that I matter to them and have reached out to me. But hopefully you can um, find something practical to take with you to um, bless that single friend. Last of all, in the last few minutes here, what about the very real loneliness factor? Um, loneliness is not simply being alone. It's rather the absence of connection. And we as women are relational beings, as you know, who were created to love and to be loved not only by God, but also by humans. It's this human connection is essential, although often lacking in our world and not only in our culture at large, it can also be lacking in the church. Um, although I would insert that those of us with church community imprinted in our DNA can hardly fathom um, the complete aloneness of those who can name only one or two people who would even notice if they disappeared. There will always be times when I feel lonely. It would be that way, even with a husband or friends that do it all right. Um, because we all have this, this God-shaped vacuum in our hearts that I don't think will ever be completely filled until we stand in God's presence and are immersed in that perfect connection. Even here on earth, God is the one who can most perfectly fill the ache for connection in my heart. Um, but while I'm here doing life in the aloneness of singleness, um, relationships with flesh and blood women give me courage and joy and visibility. And I thank God for the blessing of women, both married and single, who walk with me. Thank you for listening. Good afternoon. It, it's indeed a blessing and an honor for all of us to be learning together in this way. Uh, technology is a blessing, and the coordinating staff at Strength to Strength is a blessing, and all of you who join us today. But I am mostly grateful that God joins us as well. To begin this session, let's look in on the scene at the house of a man named Simon the Leper in Bethany. And we notice as we enter the room that there's an aroma in this room. And we see a lady crouching at Jesus' feet, and she's anointing them with a lavish oil. Where in the world did she get the money for this extravagance? Was it her dowry, her life savings, her inheritance? She comes under the criticism of masculine observers for what they call wastefulness. In the middle of their sharp tones, Jesus quickly rises to her defense, and he points out that she understands something that the others aren't seeing, that her adoration and her worship turn into an act of service for her master. It's an honor for me to speak of her today, and Jesus said we would. So with this uh, sister's act of reverence and service in our focus, let's think for the next 15 minutes what it looks like when we love our master so much that it leads us to serve in sometimes challenging ways. We are all servants first and leaders second. Jesus washed feet, and the one we're longing to copy said, Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life. And after all, we are all in this together. We are all leaders in some way, in our homes, in our classrooms, in a sibling lineup. If someone is following us, that means we're in leadership. There are countless and various ways to serve. And we'll mention some of those later. But first, I'd like to uh, consider the fact that there are two distinctly different motivations. Our motivation really makes all the difference. We can serve out of the wealth of our love for Christ. We can also serve out of an idolatrous love for ourselves and love for our own reputation. Let's see what it looks like when we understand who we are in Christ 
and we are motivated by our love for him. When we serve out of our wholeness, we're free to admit that we enjoy a responsibility given to us and consider it an honor. It's not prideful to respond enthusiastically when asked to do something. I remember being refreshed uh, by the sincerity and humility of a minister of the gospel who, when he was preached to ask at a neighboring congregation, he admitted that he loved to preach and thanked us for the privilege of coming there to do so. Or another pastor who, when someone asked him how long he had been preaching, he said, not long enough. As a whole person, I will see and respond to the needs around me without flaunting my abilities and resources. I am willing to get my hands dirty without the need for affirmation or recognition. In our serving, sisters, we must embrace humility. I speak from costly personal experience, having been an overachiever. I hope I can say that I am an ex-overachiever. It was important to me to make a difference and secretly I hope to be noticed. Do you catch the idolatrous spirit going on there? God faithfully used some relentless and painful ways to show me who I really was. I was a doer and a mover, and I'm not as proud of it as I used to be since God has helped me see the messy and hurtful trail that we movers and shakers sometimes leave behind when we trample others who are quietly serving in the background. If our motivation is leaving a name for ourselves, we are more consumed with the calling than with the one who calls us. Our serving is not who we are. Our serving is about who God is. Key concepts here are humility and wholeness. One test you can put yourself through to see if your motivation is godly or idolatrous. Let's say you think of an idea or a project or a brainstorm that would look really good. Meanwhile, someone else picks it up and runs with it. Are you able to applaud that person with your whole being? Can you praise her and initiate the cheerleading that she's doing an amazing job? Don't let your responsibility or your active service become your project or your identity. Our focus must be more we and less me. I won't spend a lot of time describing what it looks like when we serve out of love for ourselves or wanting to make a name for ourselves, but I'll insert another small illustration here to check ourselves. Like when we're asked to serve and we respond with, but she could do this so much better than I can. When I understand who I am in Christ, I am free to reach out to minister to those around me, especially those in authority and leadership over me. They are not the untouchables. In humility, I recognize that God has given me an abundance of sharing possibilities, even some that perhaps only I can offer. And as a whole person, I can be the channel through which God blesses my sister. What an incredible honor to be part of that exchange. As we think about the parable of the stewards, one was given five, one talent, one five, and one ten. Let's think about not only the honor that we receive when God hands us responsibilities or talents, but it are actually our very spiritual success depends on whether we take God's assignments seriously or not. Wives of leaders sometimes live with loneliness and misunderstandings, and in some church cultures are viewed as the untouchables, maybe um, almost sacred. I even heard a lady once describe a minister's wife as being closer to the kingdom. Perhaps a part of the reason for that kind of thinking lies in our cultural background and our culture's response to a call to leadership. Uh, for example, I'll tell you, uh, I'll give you one little exaggerated example. So thinking way, way back to when the shoes were either low top or high top, sometimes buttoned up, sometimes tied up. The understanding was that if your, your husband was ordained as a minister on a Sunday, by the next Sunday, you as his wife would be expected to wear the high top shoes by merit of being a minister's wife. Or another illustration that kind of goes with our culture, maybe, is that ordinations are sometimes almost regarded like funerals. 
allow your husband, uh, allow your leader's wife to be a normal person with needs and vulnerabilities. Her toddlers scrap too, and they cry at night. Her teens may make bad choices. Be her friend. She didn't campaign for the job. Don't use her position for your advantage. Dialogue with her in an effort to hear her heart, but not with the subtle intention of passing on vibes, hopefully all the way to the church leadership. Don't trespass where you're not invited. Don't manipulate. Few things put more wind into your leader's sails than if you volunteer before being asked. Don't be afraid to take initiative to plan things. Teach Sunday school. Coordinate a mother-daughter event. Mentor a struggling young person. Help fill a visiting minister's meal sign-up sheet as soon as it's posted. And it doesn't matter that you don't know the, the minister who's coming. I've been blessed to be part of a church community where I've been the recipient of many of the things I'm talking about here today. Presently, I have the honor of meeting monthly with three other sisters, single and married. What we do when we get together is just process life together, and we take turns talking and listening, but mostly we push each other towards God. As sisters, there is no greater gift we can give to each other than to nudge each other toward God in the processes of life. If your leader's wife is a mentor, I venture to say she craves a mentor as well. Be present. So a bit over a year ago, I was facing a potentially life-altering medical diagnosis, and we had found it out that day, that evening, my husband went to a prayer meeting and shared it with our church family. And the next morning, there was a small handful of ladies sitting in my living room. They just wanted to be there. They just wanted to pray with me. They wanted to cry with me. They wanted to hear it straight from me. Don't be afraid to show up. That morning, those ladies brought the tangible presence of God into my living room. We all know about placing the cookies in the car at church, and there's a time for baked items and cards and money gifts and flowers and gift cards, but don't get caught thinking that it takes money to be able to bless your leaders. Sometimes the gifts that don't cost money are the most meaningful, like time, a coffee date, babysitting services, helping to host guests in church. But having said all that, there is one most significant blessing that you can offer your leaders. Your personal fervent walk with God way outshines any physical token you can offer. There is no sweeter aroma than that of a life deeply committed to God, even willing to do hard things. After all, each one of us is equally ordained unto good works. Pursue God as if your life depended on it, because it does. Allow your leaders to glimpse your walk with God, give testimony, maintain a soft, sensitive heart, be vulnerable and easily entreated. We can serve with our words. Words speak life. Every one of us can be an encourager. Don't set trends that tax your leaders, but set trends that lead to a hunger and thirst for God. Thank your pastor for the message, just like you might expect him to thank you for a meal that you prepared. Have your children take notes during the message and be attentive. Stay awake. Show alertness and interest. A preacher notices. I know I'm married to one and he tells me that he notices when the congregation is sleepy. They answer for your souls, God word, God's word says. His bur this burden is not lightly disposed of. Aaron and her lifted Moses' arms. Could the ways that we hold up our leader's arms make the difference between de spiritual defeat and spiritual victory? Pray for your leaders and tell them you're praying. Ask them how you can best pray for them. In our serving, are we cumbered or dragged down? Do we run around as if we were human doings instead of human beings? When we complain to the master that our sister is not as busy in kingdom work as she should be, can you hear Jesus' word answer to our words? I have a dream that in our sisterhoods, we could practice something that I'm going to call the Revolving Care Act. Think of a hospital scene where some are in beds while others minister healing. When I am ill and suffering, you empathize and run to my rescue. When you suffer, 
I remember my own healing and minister grace and mercy to you. And I'm willing to walk with you until you're out of the hospital bed and back on staff. In this exchange lies the hope for our continued healing. None of us are always in bed, hopefully, nor are we always on staff. We take turns needing and giving care. In conclusion, I again make mention of three ladies in the Gospels who all understood serving and were motivated by their love for their master. Mary Magdalene, Lazarus' sister Mary, and also a lady without a name in Matthew and Mark. Christ validated and defended her as a woman, which was way bigger in that culture than we have ever experienced. There were people around her who misunderstood her and criticized her motives loudly. She was willing to break through cultural barriers to show her adoration for Christ. She became vulnerable. Money was not her guiding influence. She understood truths about the Messiah that the scholars and religious pious did not. He said her memory would always be spoken of like today. She was a forward thinker. For example, his burial. And I'd like to think that maybe as he agonized in Gethsemane a day or two later that the aroma of this anointing still perfumed his senses. Her love for a master led her to acts of service. Christ said about her, she hath done what she could. That would be my ultimate joy, that one day Christ would defend each one of us and say, she has done what she could. Well, my talk is about how sisters can serve members abroad. And it's something I'm really glad to talk about because it's something that the Lord has been growing in my heart over the last six years as we have walked with the family from our church. And it has become something I care very much about. I have never lived abroad. And so I have depended heavily on input from ladies who have or are currently living abroad for this talk. So now let's define a little what am I meaning by members abroad? And I'm mainly talking about ladies who are living overseas. But I would also add that it doesn't need to be limited to that. We can also have ladies who live in our home country, who um, maybe live away from our church at the time that need supporting friendships. So first of all, I'd like to talk about who is the missionary, and then two, ways we can support, support, and I'll have that into three categories. One, prayer, two, emotional and moral support, and three, home visits. So who is the missionary? I used to think, and I still hear at times, that we talk about having a call to missions versus not having a call to missions. And sometimes we talk about being called to the mission field or staying home, making it sound like it's an either or that isn't connected. But are foreign missions and staying home in competition or conflict with each other? If the Great Commission is really for everyone to participate in, then staying home doesn't give us a pass to live comfortable, unintentional lives. So how can we bring this together in our minds? In Romans 10, Paul talks about the people who have never heard about God and therefore don't know how to call in the name of the Lord to be saved. He also talks about the people who go to preach, poetically quoting Psalms saying, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And then he also talks about but how are they, the preachers, to go unless they are sent? Paul, as one who left home to go preach, knew it was important to be sent, as well as to stay connected to the greater body of Christ. Neil Parolo in his, wrote in his book, Serving as Senders, and I quote, those who go and those who serve as senders or supporters, merge their callings and talents and giftings 
to form the cross-cultural outreach team. All are equally important. All are vitally involved in fulfillment of the Great Commission. All are dynamically integrated and moving toward the same goal. And all are assured success, for those in God's work are on the winning team." Unquote. So returning to that tension of either foreign missions or staying home, could it be that both foreign missions, could it become both foreign missions and staying home missions? Could we begin to see a picture of connections of ladies across our globe, arms linked, hearts connected, all working toward the same goal? When you and I start to see ourselves as part of a global mission, we can start to move towards ladies who are living abroad, sharing each other's loads and experiencing the joys and successes of a global kingdom. So who is the missionary? I think we all are. Now, how can we support and connect with our members who are living away from us? Number one, prayer. I believe that the hand and the heart of God is moved by prayer. How can we pray? Pray for the work. This is, after all, ultimately God's work. Pray for eyes to see how he is already at work in the area and that his kingdom would come and his will would be done among the people that your members are serving. Pray for emotional, spiritual, and for the emotional, spiritual, and physical well-being of your member. Living in a foreign country can bring exposure to spiritual darkness and diseases they haven't encountered before. Learning a new language and a way of living is often difficult. Pray for emotional and mental stamina, for grace, and strength for each day. And reach out to them. Ask them for the specifics of how you can pray. So, number one, pray. Number two, emotional and moral support. Communication and emotional support is often not urgent work and may be easily forgotten. But it may be the most important work that you can do. Loneliness is often a huge part of living abroad and away from caring communities. And especially as ladies, we long for connection and relationship. Reaching out and caring help, helps members abroad feel like they aren't forgotten. I've learned as well that they not only want to be heard, they want to hear. Sharing and caring that goes both ways brings connection and blessing. Internet and phone apps have made sharing pictures, videos, and voice message so much easier, but all those tools still take an intentionality to use. Some general areas that ladies love to be kept in the loop about is church events, new babies, new dating relationships, people moving, new businesses, et cetera. Now, please hear me. I am not advocating for gossip. It takes a lot of wisdom to know the difference between gossip and sharing profitable news. Maybe a barometer for sharing is to think about how is our church changing and continuing to grow? And what could be startling to discover when they arrive back for a visit and they haven't heard about? One of the habits I've tried to maintain is to respond to any letters they send, even if it is a newsletter to a large group of people. It can mean so much to them to get a reply back that says, thank you for your letter, as well as a comment or two about what they wrote, and then a paragraph or two about my own life. But I don't want communication to just be limited to their first initiation, but for the members of our church that I'm not as closely connected to, it is one way I can make sure some sort of communication happens throughout the year. Not everybody will have the same depth of relationship, and I understand that. But for those of you that do have a closer relationship to a member who is abroad, this part is for you. Supporting your member by initiating conversations and asking questions that take the conversation below the surface and to the heart is so important. 
asking about their marriage, their emotional and spiritual health, their ministry work, and asking these things in an active listening sort of way. Neil Neil Parolo in his book, Serving as Senders, and I quote, active listening says, I am with you. I will take time. I will put energy into really listening to what your heart, not only to what your words are saying. Active listening calls for all of your attention. It obligates you to respond with respect, to express empathy, and demands you to give feedback. Unquote. Active listening requires being able to listen, but not fix people. And I'll just be honest. This kind of listing requires you to embrace the possibility of stress that it could bring to you. It could cost time and heartache. And yet, isn't this the kind of real friendships that we all need to keep us encouraged and supported and not feeling alone? And I'm gonna be a little bold here and say that I think every member abroad needs at least one person from their church who is giving this kind of listening to them. There's something about being understood by at least one person in your church that can't be replaced by any other source. I'll be honest too and say, I've often thought I'm not equipped because I haven't lived abroad. And there is a level that I can't understand. And yet, as I keep listening and engaging, I realize that often the struggles at our core aren't very different. They just look different on the surface and have different circumstances. And so with the Holy Spirit's help, I can offer insight and encouragement. I've also found that these kinds of conversations take intentionality. Having a set day and time that both of you plan on takes out the stress of coordinating it, and it also keeps it on the schedule. If you have children, involve them in the supporting work, especially if your members have children. But even if they don't, talk to your children about the members and the country and their work. Introducing our children to the work is a valuable way to broaden their world. Teach your children about the country. Check out books from the library. Try to learn everything you can. You can Have your children write letters or send messages and ask things about the country that you didn't find answers for in the book. Or use what you've learned as a conversation starter. I have a habit of reading to my daughter the newsletters from members from our church. I want to introduce my child to the life in different countries. One time when a single sister was on a home visit, she thanked me for teaching my daughter about her country and her work. She said that as a single lady who enjoys children, coming back to church and having the children not remember her is hard. She said, your daughter knows me and that means a lot. And I would just say the blessing goes both ways. Involve your children in sending letters or packages in the mail. It is so special to receive mail. Especially for children who are living abroad, it is so special to be remembered on their birthday. Sometimes it is worth paying that expensive postage to be a means of blessing. Find out what would be special to receive. If money and effort are being spent, it's often a greater blessing to the members to have some say in what comes rather than to receive things that they can't use. Another blessing for children is to receive voice messages, videos, or initiate video calls. Children love to see each other, even if they feel shy and the adults end up doing most of the talking. And lastly, for emotional and moral support, send someone from your church to visit them. Visits from people from home can be a huge blessing and gift. My family had the gift and privilege this summer of the church sending us to visit the family we are involved with supporting. There is something about being able to experience the country with all of the senses, to taste the food, to smell the neighborhood, to see the landscape, to meet the people that are important to them. That brings depth and connection that you can't get any other way. So sometimes the area might be 
tropical or touristy, and it's tempting to see it as a vacation. And I'm not saying that you can't enjoy those things, but field visits are not a time for personal vacation for you. The purpose of the trip is to learn and serve, not to be served. Field visits are a blessing when you come wanting to learn about the work and their world and meet the people who are important to them. Having come, children come to visit children is so special and builds friendship and connection that lasts for a long time. These trips can be expensive, and so to have the church help with the finances is a huge gift. When everybody contributes to a trip, it becomes the church's mission. And then when you return, tell the church about the trip, show pictures, try to help them experience a little more about the members' world and work. So now I've talked about prayer support, emotional and moral support. And lastly, let's talk about home visits. Depending how long your member has lived abroad and how vastly different the cultures are, home visits can be an emotionally hard trip to navigate. When a person has invested heavily into a work and a culture, it begins to become a new home. And so returning to the place that once was home but isn't any longer can feel a little disorienting. It might not be safe to assume that it feels like a relief to your member to be back in their passport country. Being aware of this and asking how they are feeling instead of assuming you know is a good practice. Some practical ways that you can straight, take stress off of a home visit are make sure that they have a place to stay when they're there. Sometimes that's a, it just takes care of itself, but sometimes it doesn't. Make sure they have a vehicle to drive. And we're good at this. Make sure they have food to eat. <laughs> Welcoming with people with food that is prepared as well as some staples is a huge gift. I'm told that shopping in America can be overwhelming with all the options and then needing to adjust to different currency again is, um, is a blessing if you don't need to navigate that right away. Invite them for meals, or if they need rest more than they need socializing, just take the meal to them. Make space in your conversations to hear about their lives. I don't think the members want it to be all about them, but it means a lot when you take the extra effort to hear about a world that you don't know much about. Share about your world as well, but be aware of how your sharing could affect them. Unloading emotional and relational struggles onto your member because they are neutral, safe ear could be heavy and draining for them. If your member returns to the field and feels the need to debrief from a home visit, it makes time away from the field a counterproductive experience. Another way to bless is to plan an event and invite numerous people so your member can see them at one time. Now, this may not be a blessing to everyone, so check in with your member about what size and type of event would be a blessing. And again, involve your children in welcoming children. Have them welcome them with little cards or gifts. Prepare your children for how they can welcome the visiting children into the circle of children at church so that they feel at home. And lastly, consider giving money gifts. Often home visits can be expensive. And sometimes they're a time to buy things to take back with them that they can't get in the country they're serving. Giving money can ease financial stress. So now we've talked about how to pray, to give emotionally and morally, and to welcome them back for visits. Depending on your relationship to your members, not all of these ways of supporting will be feasible, and I understand that. I gave a lot of ideas, and now I just leave you with the invitation to take these to God and ask him what he wants you to take away from what you have heard. And may you experience the joy of supporting and giving. Thank you so much, 
Charlene and Susan and Crystal. Ah, we've heard so much and I feel like God has been so faithful. Um, I could hear from each of you, the passion in your heart for your subject coming through. And I believe that passion actually was a spirit moving. And so thank you. My heart is full, but I'd also really like to open this time that we can hear from you all. Um, if anyone has a question or even a comment, let's just open it up and we can share and learn together. Maybe I should ask you first of all, Linnell, are there any questions in the chat box? Not yet, but any of you are welcome to submit a question through the chat button at the bottom and we will ask it for you. I have a question. Um, could Miss Susan expound more on how to put gifts from God to use to work hard while not trampling others, being prideful or neglecting family? Did you hear that question, Susan? That's an I did. excellent I, question. I did. My brain processes are moving, <laughs> but I hope most of all, it's in the Holy Spirit. Um, I think um, praying for sensitivity to how might this capacity, um, how is it being filled by someone else that I might not be um, aware of? That's, I think, where the trampling comes in sometimes when uh, we assume that I've been asked, I can go do this, and uh, everybody else step back. Um, trying to gain a sensitivity about yeah what the needs are and what need hasn't been filled. And then going there carefully uh, by the only with the urgency of the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not quite sure if I understood perfectly what your question was. Do you have something else to say? That was pretty much it, but, but yeah, just um, being able to work hard and not be prideful, use, use gifts that God has given us, but not be prideful about it or hurt others or take on so much that families neglected, even while we try to serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think a, a very keen awareness that this is not about me, but it is about God and Bless him, but he is faithful that if we get it wrong, he has ways of gently reminding us. They're not always fun, but he has ways. <laughs> Thank you for that question and also for your response, Susan. I think that's just so true. Um, I think I heard Charlene and Crystal and Susan, each of you, more than once talked about the spirit. I think so much just depends on us being able to actually hear God's spirit leading us. Something that really blessed me and stood out to me today is um, Susan especially brought it out is humility and just how serving like, I don't know, it can almost seem like a bit of a, I oh, can't think of the right word, but you know, you think that it can be pride, right? Like it can be, if you're not serving and you can kind of, you could look at someone else who is serving and think it's prideful. I don't know if you know what I'm talking about, but I feel like that can so much be the case when 
what it actually takes. I mean, it can be pride, like Susan brought out, but so often the case is that it takes humility to reach out to people, like, because you're making yourself vulnerable, you're running the risk of that person, whether it's people abroad, whoever you all spoke on that single sister, you're running the risk of them saying, you know, no, I don't like not taking the hand you hold out. I don't know how to explain that clearly, but like, you're just, you just, it's not always easy to make yourself vulnerable. And I, I think it takes a lot of humility to do that, to be there for people and to share. Sometimes it takes a sharing on our part before someone else is willing to share and feel safe to. But yes, thank you so much, all of you for sharing that. I was very blessed. You know, that stood out to me too. I think maybe, well, Charlene, you mentioned it first, but I think it came through just the vulnerability. And I thought about that as you were sharing, Charlene, like for myself, I don't think, I, I have friends who are unmarried and I value and I love them. But I think I could tend to be like, well, you know, I have nine children and it's not at all that I consider them lesser, but I may not want to dump my bad day on them <laughs> just because it could seem like, you know, are you just ungrateful that you have children or something like that? And so I, I really appreciated that reminder that, um, and you said that we have to there again, um, allow the spirit to help us and just ask people and learn to know them. I think you also said about that too, that relationship, it's easier to serve those that we know well, and that is true. But to allow that relationship to go two ways and the ministry that maybe sometimes when I do have a bad day um, to not be afraid to just be honest about that because we know your life is crazy busy if you have nine children and if you're going to try to always make it look like this picture perfect um, life we're, we're going to know you're not being honest with us and the fact that you will tr and trust your struggles to us um, also make it easier for us then to talk about our struggles to you, um, despite the fact that they might be very different. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to all of you ladies for sharing. I think what really came out, the theme that all of you had in common was that whether in ministry or on the foreign field or, or single, sisters are just sisters and they're regular people and they just need the same relationship uh, sensitivities that we all do. And that was such a good reminder. Thank you for the very practical, specific things that you brought out, but thank you also for just the theme that's common to all of us. And uh, that was really good to just be reminded to reach out um, in that way. Thank you. I thought about that, that for all of us, you know, we were kind of talking um, with lives that can look so different, you know, you know, I'm the mother of nine children, I'm relating to my single friend, or I live in Kenya, and then relating to my friend whose life is so different, you know, in Lancaster County, or maybe um, I understand what it's like to be in a leadership position, and just our lives are so different, but yet it's, it's not about focusing on our differences, but really that we're all the same. And I, I heard that, you know, we're just, we're all created in God's image and how, because of that, we have a lot of the same struggles and the same longings to just know and to be known. And I, I'd like to just add with, um, with that, it's so important to let go of any sense of competition. We are so all in this together. I can perhaps bring something into the equation that you cannot, but you bring into the relationship something that I have no idea how to do. 
And so we do it together. That's a beautiful reminder. <laughs> What other, <clears throat> excuse me, what other thoughts and questions do you have? I was just thinking how this is a fitting way to end the year of Strength to Strength Sisters in talking about giving and serving. And I think that the all three of you touched on the, the word that stood out to me from all three of you is the word notice, just to notice other people. And that's what I want to take away from this talk is to remind myself to notice, to notice that single sister, to notice the, the leader's wife, to notice members abroad. And another takeaway that I have, too, is that I can involve my children in noticing as well. And it's. And I stand with seven blessings that I can teach them how to do it so that when they are older, they can pass that on as well. And I'm just, yeah, I'm really inspired by you all sharing and thank you for that. There is a comment that came in that says, I'm so thankful for all of you ladies. I've been learning so much through this ministry. What a gracious God we serve. Amen. That's And, you know, I, I love the way you said that, Lenal, because I thought, too, this is just a wonderful way to end the year, um, to just to be able to allow God to help us care enough about others to share. Because, you know, for all of us, we can look around and it doesn't matter what category you're in. But like you said, there's people to notice. I really also like when Charlene talked about how it's so easy for us to interpret people's actions through the lens of our perceptions. Not, I don't think I quite have your quote there. And, um, and I think that applied to each of your talks. I was also thinking about the fact of how expectations comes in here and how um, on the flip side of caring is also receiving and that God would help me to be able to receive well. I think sometimes it's easier for me. I'd rather give to others than receive, honestly. <laughs> it's just, it, you do, it's not as vulnerable position. And just to be able to be whole enough that I can receive, that, you know, having received God's grace to me, then I can allow others to minister to me too. It was a good reminder as I was listening. <laughs> I don't want to cut off anyone. Lanelle, was there anybody else who put a question in? Okay. If there's any other thoughts. Another thing I thought, I think you all each mentioned loneliness and how um, for the, the person who's single, um, the person in a leadership position or whose husband is in a leadership position, um, and also for living abroad, there is just that element of single of loneliness that can be there. And how, um, I think Charlene, you're the one who said that we have this God-shaped vacuum and how it's really 
maybe all this side of heaven is never going to be totally filled. But I'm really excited about what we heard today and how God can use each of us to just be a small portion, a small portion of being his um, ambassadors to those around us. And how, you know, none of us are called to do everything, but if all of us can do the small thing that we're called to do and to think about how that can multiply, that, that's just such a beautiful thought to me. There's another note here that came in on the chat. It says a big thank you, thank you to Crystal for her talk on missions. I'm living abroad and can stress the importance on supporting your sister emotionally. I feel so blessed when someone messages me and says she's praying for me or even asks me how I'm holding up. Yes, I can testify to that. How it's amazing how and how it can be like random in quotes. I know nothing's random. How uh, someone can, I remember one time we were kind of going through something and somebody in our church message and I was almost like did they did they know like you know it's kind of like so strange how the message came at just that time and how I think they just acted on what the spirit's prompting was and how, what a blessing that was in my life another question that came in this is directed to Charlene um, when inviting singles to a gathering, do you mind being the only single or should we invite several singles? Well, it depends a little on the group. Um, it can feel a bit unique sometimes to be the only single there. Um, it's fun to have that other single friend, single sister, maybe, who's also invited with you. But it does depend a little on the group, because if it's a group that I know really well, um, maybe even a group of, you know, extended family, and most of the cousins my age are married, except for me, it, that that doesn't feel as strange. Um, yeah, I think it depends a little on how well you know them. Because if you don't, if you don't know them super well and you're the only one there, I don't know, it could maybe be a bit strange. Yeah, it's, it's fun. I know when I lived in state college and that was a community where I didn't have my family, um, you know, things like praying before the meals or, um, like, who do you sit beside at church when everybody sits as one big family? And most of the families, I felt very fine with just sitting with them. Um, but it can be fun to have that sidekick beside you who, who can do it with you. One more thing I'd say with this is that when I first moved to State College, I was the only, the only single uh, woman working in the community. And I'm grateful now that that's how it was because it, it forced me to um, find my social world with the families. And so I built these great relationships with the families whose children I was teaching in school. By the time I left uh, three years later, there were six of us girls in the community and we made, we had this really tight sisterhood who we, yeah, they blessed my life, my life in so many ways. But I was glad it wasn't turned around because I'm afraid if I would have had that sisterhood first, I would never have gotten to know the families. But by the time they all arrived, I already had these great connections, especially with the moms of my students. And they, those connections now have continued. I've been gone several years now, but I, State College is still one of my favorite places to go back because even though many of the single women have moved on, my married friends are still there. And it's, it's this wonderful connection. 
and it was fine being the only one it forced me to reach out and not just um stick with the people like me <laughs> thank you for that charlene that was some good insights there and just yeah just that reminder about how sometimes the blessing is waiting maybe where we weren't expecting to find it <laughs> or at least maybe the place we would maybe least expected I should say Crystal I did have a question for you you talked about when you were talking about your emotional support so could you tell us a little bit like how you structure I'm just curious how you structure your connection. I think you have a specific, as I understand, you have a specific couple that you walk with from your church or abroad. And so with the wife, like how do you, do you schedule phone calls? How often, or I just love to hear. It. Sure. Um, so with the wife, we talk every other week and, um, and it's not like we need to uh, go through a list of questions every time, but the intent is to, um, to go deeper and uh, just have a set time that we, um, that we can bring these things that we're carrying and, and have, a, have a time that we talk. Um, and then as a, um, as a couple, um, there's actually three other families from our church that are part of what we call a support team. And we meet regularly. So try to once a month and then do a Zoom call with our family abroad. And that is a time to pray together, to, um, to talk about decisions that they're needing to make, um, to talk about how they're doing um, emotionally, spiritually, um, and any logistics that they need, um, keep tabs on how they're doing financially. Um, yeah, so that is for sure, um, uh, once a month. And then we have a messaging app. And so that can, there's often messages that come oftener than that. And it's an easy way to connect with everybody on that team. Thank you for those details. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank yeah. you for those details. That sounds very intentional. And, but it sounds, yeah, I can definitely see where that um, regularity leads to being able to go deeper. You mm -hmm. caught that, you, you used that term that your goal is to be able to go deeper. Mm -hmm. There's another comment that came in here that says, as someone living abroad, it's an incredible blessing to have a couple ladies that I know I can text with prayer requests at any time of the day or night, and they will intercede for whatever situation we're facing. They are interested in our ministry and the people we're dealing with and are good at checking in to see how things are going. Bless the Lord. Yes. And I would definitely say I, I appreciate how God has blessed us as I was listening to um, your three, but all of you sharing how thinking in my own life, how God has blessed me with people who have input. And I thought to myself, not sure if I'll do it now. It's kind of getting late here, but maybe tomorrow I need to send people some messages and some intentional thank yous for the way people have blessed me <laughs> and our family and have just really, um, gone out of the way to do that. I don't want to take that for granted. <laughs> I don't want to be cutting anyone off. Um, but no, you don't, do you have any more comments? Okay. No, not at this point. Okay. 
Um, and just a special thank you once again for all of you just so beautifully and so vulnerably sharing. Um, Charlene, that just really, it was, it was not only was it interesting to me as a blessing, and even you, Crystal, just telling us what you do. I know sometimes that could even be hard <laughs> to just be able to say, you know, this is how we're supporting someone, but I enjoyed hearing that. And Susan, just your perspective on, um, you know, what it's like to walk, you know, alongside your husband in leadership and, you know, what has been a blessing to you. Just really, really appreciate your all sharing today. And I was trying to take notes pretty fast. And I don't think I got everything, but I have a lot of food for thought to go back over and listen to again. So thank you. Thank you, each of you. Um, I'm just praying that God will really bless you really well. Um, but before we end our talk, I'd like to tell you more about what we have planned for the first part of next year. We're so excited and how Linnell mentioned, this is the end of our first full year. I guess we, we didn't have a talk um, every month beginning this year, but the end of our first full year is Strength to Strength Sisters. And it's just been exciting to see how God has blessed this platform. And so we'd like to announce um, our plans for next year, for the first six months of next year, we're planning to do a series, our first series on intentionality. So we'll have different topics on different areas of intentionality. And we're excited to share that in January, Laura Coravilla, she would be married to Finney and lives in Boston, is planning to share with us as the Lord wills on modesty, seeking God's heart for his daughters. So we would invite you all to come back and share that with us. Now, one thing to note, our talks are generally the first Saturday of the month, but this talk will, is scheduled for January 14th. So it is actually the second Saturday in January, but the time is the same at three o'clock Eastern Standard Time. So we will look forward to um, sharing together and God bless you all as you go through your final weeks this year and look forward to a new year. Susan, I'd like to ask you if you can pray for us before we end this call. Let's pray. Thank you. Dear Father, it's been such a blessing to sit at your feet alongside these sisters around the globe today. We're in awe that you allow us to be your hands and your feet to minister to others in kingdom work. We admit that we don't always get it right, but gracious that you are, you always give us another chance. Lord, you know where each one of us are finding ourselves in our present challenges. Please meet us in our neediness. Use our vessels to pour out onto others your grace, Lord, and your love. We need to decrease so that, Lord, you can increase. Again, you've been so gracious to meet us here. We look forward to sitting at your feet day after day. Just show us, continue to show us what that looks like. Bless the administrator sisters here at Strength to Strength as they juggle this kingdom work alongside their babies and families. Help us to remember that, after all, it's all kingdom work and no task is too great or too small to do for you. We love you, Father, and we owe our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much, everyone. We'll see you next time. Goodbye. Walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, 